All right, guys, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, honestly, who thought that this title is a bit of marketing? Okay, there's like, uh, let's say like 10% of you. Um, so thank you for showing up anyway, I, I want to say. Um, to make it short, my name is Frank, and this title is not marketing. Um, we had the customer, Western Digital, and they were running a HPC application with one million virtual CPUs. That's like half a million cores, to be honest, um, in the cloud on EC2. Um, they did simulations, magnetic simulations for hard disks. And um, you probably don't know this, but those people, they use Docker images. So Docker is a quite typical format in HPC. They put those Docker images on ECR, which is the container registry that we have at AWS, and they created one single cluster with one million v vCPUs. Uh, what I like a lot is they leverage spot instances, which is this, you know, these instances where you bid for the price and you get like, uh, on average, maybe 80% price reduction. So their simulation time went down from three weeks to eight hours. And I think that's quite a, a breakthrough. So using a million cores in the cloud is, is possible today. Um, maybe the skeptics now still think like, yeah, you did this once and probably there was like hundreds of engineering people behind and planning for this. It, it's not true. I mean, if you want to do this, you can do it. There is more examples. Um, I think this one is actually even older. It's 1.1 million virtual CPUs. They uh, did topic. Um, classification for machine learning. And this is the curve where you see how they kind of built up the, the number of um, CPUs um, over time. Right, um, let me tell you a bit of a personal story. This was kind of my first job description. So I spent a, a while in, in brain research and uh, at the university clinic. And my uh, that time boss told me, look, this is I mean, this was the result of what I did in, in many years, but he told me, we want to do something like this, but the problem is the calculation right now takes like 12 days. Um, and it's a university clinic. This is where you go when you're severely ill. So my boss said, you know, most of these patients or some of these patients, they are dead before you come up with these colorful images. Can you change it? Now, when I went to university, I thought my first job would be look, this is a web application and can you make it load faster? No, and this guy said, you know, we have those people and some of them might die before we can even put, uh, we, before we can even put a good diagnosis on them. What you see here is a functional brain image. So it's not showing anatomy, it's not showing structure, it's not showing what you get with an X-ray, it's showing function. So it's the output of a four dimensional data set. It's a 3D brain image over time and, um, I don't want to don't go into many details, but at the end, it's like an optimization problem, not unlike what you do with machine learning. So gradient descent in a n-dimensional um, space is working really well. Um, but it took like 12 hours to, to calculate this. And um, at the end, this was the result of, of many years of, uh, well, interdisciplinary work. And um, we got it published in one of the best papers ever. What you see is, as I said, function of the brain, it's uh, showing actually the, the density of opiate receptors per square, no, per, what is it, cubic millimeter in brain tissue. And so every color codes like there is that many opiate receptors, which is also the dark red area is where pain processing is happening. And the same kind of images can be generated for other functional things. Like we had a lot of children coming to us and they suffered from epilepsy. Normally you get pills and they're okay. Uh, for some of these children, those pills are not working. And then um, it's possible to detect those, you know, those red spots. And depending on where in the brain it is, you can surgically uh, remove them. But if you show this to a surgeon, the surgeon says, well, the brain tissue looks normal. I don't see anything different because it's just a function that is not correct. So these images are super important. And imagine this, somebody tells you, okay, Nice to have you here. Um, first, a good, have a good first day. Um, and can you make this faster? What would you do? And actually, this was a couple of years ago. If you talk to high-performance computing people that work in this HPC space, that work with supercomputers, 
they have a long running joke and it says, you know, to make things faster, to, to get a good speed up, you know what the best thing is that you can do? It's, uh, it's not showing. It's actually go surfing. Go surfing for 18 months and then remember Amdahl's law that says, you know, the number of processors and the CPU um, throughput is kind of doubling every 18 months. So go surfing for 18 months and then come back and you have a speed up of two. Now you're laughing. Uh, it used to be a joke because it never worked. And it never worked because obviously if you come back after 18 months, what you have is the still, the still the same high performance computer that you bought 18 months ago. Nothing has changed. So you don't get this, this speed up now. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that these HPC computers, they're usually bought or leased or rented for four to five years. So you have them and you keep them for five years and then you renew them. So this joke used to be a joke for a long time, but it's not anymore. If you go to the cloud, we work uh, really, really hard to give you the newest hardware and the newest Intel processors. So if you go surfing for 18 months, wear sunscreen, um, and then come back and enjoy the newest technology and you will see this speed up. So what used to be a joke is reality now. The other thing is when I was trying to do these, these brain simulations, um, uh, I'm based in Munich, there is a supercomputing center, Leibniz Rechenzentrum, um, and I said, hey guys, we have this, this great application and can I run this on your HPC thing? And they said, well, you have to write an application, fill out those forms, and there is a committee deciding if we take you or not. And guess what? They said no. I mean, I was a student and they said no. Look, the computer is busy. And the thing is, those computers, they're always busy because they're always used for scientific computing and they use grids. And if you, you know, if you have the grid, you have like um, to the power of two more, um, more, you need to the power of two more resources. So whatever computer they buy after four years, after five years, they always keep it busy and it's always fully loaded. So you never get access as a, as a newbie like I was. And um, well, even, even though I like uh, this story that we, we got it published really well a lot. The other thing is there is kind of a fixed capacity for those computers, for those HPC computers, but not in the cloud. If you come to us, what we can do is uh, we can run as many of these jobs that you want to calculate in parallel whereas this HPC computer has this fixed capacity. And then you only pay for what you use, that's the core principle of the cloud, and I guess you know this, but in this case it's even more important. If you had asked me like those many years ago, if I wanted to invest like $500 for getting these results more quickly, I would have paid this out of my own pocket, honestly, like $500 and you have like, I mean you shortcut you, PhD program that takes three or four years and you get those results, you know, the next day. Of course I would pay this, but they wouldn't even let me pay the money because they said, no, 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 this HPC, HPC thing is busy, you can't use it. If you come to the cloud, you obviously pay your bill, but you just pay for what you use and you get the results. So it's a whole different story. And this slide is kind of to, to illustrate the situation. Imagine such an HPC computer I've seen several of them. I visited like three of those um, high performance computing centers. Like usually the tape library that they use to do the backups is like the size of this room and the computer is maybe like four times the size of this room. And that's the fixed size that you will have. And this is what I told you, this is always busy with different workloads put together so to maximize um, the usage of the computer. Whereas on the second chart you see what you could do um, in the cloud. You can run your jobs in parallel and exceed this fixed size that you get from an HPC machine. Now some of you say, well, but you also have these resource limits in AWS now, and people know that they cannot start more than n instances of a certain EC2 type. That's true, but all of them are soft limits now. They are there to protect you, first of all. If you send us an email, we are happy to raise those limits and you can have more. No, you have to be aware of the consequences. Actually, we use this email for capacity planning. No, people always say, couldn't it be then that I need more instances that you have? Well, the thing is, because of this soft limit mechanism, we can plan ahead. And if you want us to raise this limit, we ask you how many do you want? 
How often do you want them? Is it a peak thing? Is it a permanent thing? And we kind of forward project this for capacity planning. So the situation is very, very different today. Looking into more details um, and focusing on the details, of course, the core is compute. And as I said, we work super hard to give you the best compute possible. And I want to specify a little bit more what is the best compute, because also this has changed over time. Then it's storage. It's, it's a lot about storage. I will quickly talk about storage. And the core is networking. And this is what people forget. Uh, I mean, I can tell you what we did to get these brain images at that time. Um, we had the, the, the 12 days was the runtime for running it on an SGI workstation, which is like a, a workstation that that time cost like, might be the equivalent of 25,000 euros today. No, they, they don't exist anymore. Um, and what we did at the end is, because I didn't get access to this HPC machine, we bought a Linux cluster. I bought a Linux cluster and put it together with a gigabit switch. Um, but networking is the thing that kind of separates those home-built clusters from a real high-performance computing. So networking, in my opinion, is core. And I want to explain a little bit more what has changed about low-latency networking in the cloud. And the other thing is automation. You need to orchestrate the whole thing, and you want to visualize your results. Looking at the choice that you have, um, there's like 190 different instance types and configurations. And that's kind of super important because if you look at what those students do in the HPC or area or in, in any area like you know modeling of, of these brain images or modeling of what happens if, if a car company um, tries to simulate when a car crashes against the wall, what they do is very often they try to adapt algorithms to run it faster, to get a 4% or 7% speed up on this particular type of high performance computer. Now what we give you is 190 different instance types that you can choose from. So we think you should adapt the hardware to your problem and not the problem to the hardware. And if you consider this, I think it makes a lot of sense. Like why would you spend four years um, with a graduate student um, optimizing an algorithm to a particular hardware, couldn't it, couldn't it just uh, go the other way around? And run your tests, you can run many tests in parallel and find out what is the best um, hardware for your problem. Now, picking the hardware <laughs> got a little bit more difficult because we have these 190 different instance types. So quick explanation, what does it mean if you take a P3DN24X large instance? Um, P3 is the instance type, so P is general purpose, but it comes with a GPU. Um, D3 is like the version number. There was a P1, P2 before. And the D and the N, it's capabilities. Just imagine D for disk. Um, it's actually a SSD, which is a NVM-based SSD. It's a very fast local SSD. And the N is for network. So it's a super fast network, TCP IP network, that gives you 100 gigabit per second. And then we have the instance size. It's the 24x large, which means it comes with 96 virtual CPUs and 256 gigabyte of RAM and eight of these NVIDIA V100 cards. So this is how to read the, the, the instance types. Now, looking in, I want to show you three different instance types just to give you a feeling what is possible. The P3DN, I already explained it now. You understand what, what it's good for. The GPUs, actually, as you know, they're very often used for machine learning. So the G is for graphics, but a lot of people don't ever do graphics. It's just they have a lot of cores that you can use in parallel. Machine learning tasks are highly parallel. So this is why those people want to use the GPUs. So this is the P3DN. Then we have one instance type that is a kind of, it's, it's kind of a little bit exotic. Um, because there is a relatively low number of CPU cores per instance, um, but those CPU cores, they have a sustained throughput rate of four gigahertz. Um, so the, the intro to, to this talk was using a million CPUs now, but now I tell you we have those instances with, with a low number of cores. Why would they be attractive at all? The answer is um, there are certain kind of applications where you pay per core 
and uh, the core that you pay for, you want to have it as, well, as, as efficient as possible. Um, I think we can say it like Oracle databases, no? If you don't use a RDS service for a managed database and you run, want to run it yourself, you pay per core, and then you're happy to have this four gigahertz of sustained throughput, but you don't want to have too many cores because otherwise your bill goes up. And there is other applications where it's a lower number of cores makes more sense, makes more sense whenever you cannot use this, this uh, level of parallelism. And then there is an instance size, that's the last one I want to point out, the C5N. So the C5, it's like the N, remember, it's for the networking, 100 gigabit per second. Massively scalable performance. It's good for all network-bound um, applications that you might want to run. So this is like the instance types, and the, the, the processors are typically the newest and fastest Intel processors. And that was like the the story for a long time, like can we get those Intel processors even a little bit earlier than you could get them and buy them in a store. And for the first time, um, we announced um, AMD processors. Now the AMD story is very easy, it's Intel compatible. Um, for the same instance types, like for the M5, we offer M5A, for the R5, we offer R5A, and for the T3, you can get a T3A with an AMD processor which is good because you save on average like 10% of the cost for the same performance. So why would you not use it? And it's binary compatible. So you can run the same kind of software. And this 10% can make a big difference. I just told you that, you know, PhD students work like four years and they get the 4% speed up. So 10% is a rather big number. Okay, so it's the AMD processor and it's something you can easily just try and see if it works for you. There's something that sounds similar, but it's very, very different. And it's um, it's a, it's an instance type that we call A. And we call it A1 because it's the first version. And it's based on a ARM processor. And as you know, the ARM processor is what you have in your mobile phones. It's also what you have in Raspberry Pis. And this is not binary compatible to you know your SAP and your Oracle software. So you cannot run this kind of software on these processors but you can, you, know, you can run your microservices that you build and compile yourself um, on a ARM processor. So for the first time ever, you see these ARM processor class in a server machine in the cloud. And the reason is that the processor cost um, compared to you know, the energy that it produces is, is rather low. So it's not the total cost, but the, the cost per energy that it produces. So um, we made very, very detailed calculations and we found out that if, if you use it for your microservices, you get like a 45% of cost reduction um, for the same throughput. And as always, we encourage you to do your own measurements. Um, 45 sounds like a marketing number, but there's really a detailed um, calculation behind and there's a, a blog posting from the guy who builds our data centers that goes into great details. Um, so people love this. They, they like these low-cost processes whenever they want to scale out their microservices architecture. And I'm always joking. I say you have one monolith and then you split it into 117 microservices. But I just read an article about Uber where they wrote that they have over 4,000 microservices. Now think about 4,000 and you say 45% with, with the same um, throughput. That's an amazing number. No, that's like a really huge number. And for the first time ever, this is possible. Now, if you put this all together, we have those newest Intel processors. We try to give you the GPUs for the machine learning and for the other tasks that you can run on a GPU. We give you the AMDs. We give you the, um, the ARM processors that we custom built. And um, there is a new processor that we announced. It's called Inferentia. Um, and this Inferentia processor is a kind of replacement for the GPUs. The GPUs are very expensive because they're built for graphics, and we thought we can do it cheaper and give you the same number of cores, the same level of parallelism, and it's called Inferentia. It's announced, and it will be um, available soon. So you can choose. You can, we want to give you choice. That's a core principle of what we're trying um, to do. Right, then I already announced that it's usually about networking. You know, that's the difference between this home-built cluster 
that like I built many years ago to calculate those brain images with a gigabit networking switch um, and a real supercomputer. The real supercomputer has a network um, that gives you very low latencies and that's, that's very hard to achieve in computer science. The bandwidth is very easy. You can always put in a second uh, network card and you can put a second cable um, to your switch and you double the bandwidth. No, that's not the problem, but reducing the latency is a super hard problem. And you get to a limit where it's almost impossible to further reduce the latency and you hit the limit of you know, the TCP IP stack and the operating system and then the lower you go, the more the chitter starts, the more variation you will see, so there is no constant low um, latency. So all these problems show up. And you can actually fix them exactly the same way. Um, once you understood that the TCP IP stack and the operating system, like the copying uh, of the buffers is the problem, you just avoid them, you don't do it. A lot of people would say, well, if you take away the TCP IP stack, then what else can we do? The answer is you don't need those machines for you know, your Chrome browser and HTTP that runs on top of TCP IP. You need them for, well, HPC applications that are very often programmed in a library that is called MPI, Message Passing Interface. It's a bit like you know, sending Kafka messages or JMS messages, and it exists since, I don't know, I've, I know it's since 20 years. So it's the standard and a lot of super, supercomputers are either programmed in this way, or they have compilers that make use of, uh, of those vector processors. But a lot of those highly parallel machines use MPI. Now for MPI, if you only do the message passing, we can bypass this TCP IP stack, and that's exactly what we do. So there is hardware, it's called EFA, electric, uh, sorry, Elastic Fabric Adapter, and that's the hardware. And to access the hardware, we build a special library and this special library, you see it here, that's the normal way. You run your MPI implementation on top of the TCP IP stack. That's what I was doing years ago uh, with this Linux cluster because all I had was the TCP IP stack. Today what we can do is we run the MPI implementation on top of libfabric. And this libfabric is the library that lets you access the hardware, this EFA um, kernel driver directly. So it doesn't mean that there is no TCP IP stack on this machine anymore, it still exists, it's a different network card, um, but there is also this direct access to um, EFA. And if you look into more details and do like how to scale algorithms, typically the latency that you need for the message passing is the crucial point. So the lower the latency, the better you can scale your algorithms and the better you can use like a large number of processors. Right, so that's the networking part. And then there is the file system part. What we did is we um, support for the first time a uh, true HPC file system. It's called Luster. The name might sound a little bit strange. It's a combination of cluster and Linux, Linux and cluster. So this is why it's called Luster. And I, I looked it up a while ago and uh, I found a Wikipedia article where it said like, I think most the majority of all top 100 um, HPC computers in the world, there's a ranking, they use this file system. And they use it because it gives you very low latencies again, it's always about latency, and it gives you great throughput. And we support a native version of this Luster file system. It's called um, AWS FX Luster. It's a parallel file system, so the, um, we can use parallelism. Um, it's based on SSDs. And, um, oops, let me do this. And um, the thing is, the more storage you add, the more throughput you get, and there is a consistent um, low latency access to your objects. Mm -hmm. And you can also access objects, map objects from S3 onto this file system, objects that already exist in S3. You create the file system, you access them via the Luster file system, and then at the end of your computation, they just go back to S3. So it's a kind of direct mapping from the S3 object blob store to FSX. Right, and the last thing that I want to point out is Parallel Cluster, and this Parallel Cluster is a open source project, and it's an open source project that we had under a different name. It was called CFN Cluster for a while, <laughs> and then it got so popular that we put some more engineering resources behind. Uh, we open sourced it, 
And it's basically a, a Python, well, a Python framework, a Python program that you install with pip, and then you can create your own HPC machine on top of what we give you as the AWS cloud. Um, that's the idea. Um, there is different configurations. It's based on Python. It's kind of easy to operate. If you see it for the first time and you've never seen uh, HPC world, it might look a bit simple to you um, because what is happening in this HPC world, people work with uh, schedulers and queues and you queue your job and then you wait um, for the result. How much time do I have left? 15 minutes? Plenty. Okay. Then I'm trying to show you just what this luster, uh, sorry, what this parallel cluster is doing. Um, before I conclude, basically what you get is uh, you install it with pip install parallel cluster. Uh, if you have your Python environment and then you have the p cluster command and you can say p cluster configure, you can configure your cluster and then you create a cluster and then you submit a job and then you see the output. So that's the whole idea. Let me try and see if this is working. Okay, so I have pcluster installed because I don't want to do the pip install. What I can do is I can say pcluster list and you will see that I have a cluster already which is called HPC1 here. And um, I've created this yesterday. If I want to create a new one, what I would do is I would say pcluster and configure, configure. And it then says um, what cluster template do you want? I want a default one. Then it says, what region do you want to run the cluster in? And I want to use um, Ireland, which is EU West 1. Um, what's the name of your um, VPC? Um, you need a key to, uh, to talk um, to the master instance of the cluster. So that's the P cluster key that I, I, I defined before. And then you need the subnet and the subnet ID. And uh, that's the, the subnet and the subnet for the master, and then this config file is generated. And it's actually written to, if I go to parallel cluster and config, and that's the file. So it's basically a key value file defining um, whatever I specified. I put in some extra values, and those are the ones that I want to point out. Um, compute instance type C518XL, that's the big compute instance that I told you, the C5 for the compute nodes, the M5 for the master node. You don't need a big one for the master node because it's just, you know, the master node. And then there is a maximum queue size. Now, the queue size is the maximum number of those compute instances that I want to run, and the minimum number is zero. So it starts from zero, and actually the other value is the, ah, that's it, I see it right here. It's the scale down idle time. So after 240 minutes, if I don't use it, it will scale down. So the maximum would be four of those C518X large, which cost like $3 a piece per hour. And if I don't use it for 240 minutes, it will scale down to zero. If you set the initial size and the max size both to four, it will stay at four. So it's really like a hardware cluster that you have and you can define if it should be elastic and scale down or not scale down. Now, um, let's go here, which is, um, I created a cluster already. Um, what it does is um, if, I, if I run the create cluster, it will take this configuration file, it will create a cloud formation template and create the resources. And that's what I've done already because it takes a couple of minutes and then if I'm lucky, ah, cool, um, then I can connect to the master node. So I say P cluster and connect to the cluster and I can say Q host and you see the, that's the main node and I could also say Q stat, that's the Q and there is nothing queued. Now, I have a, actually a very embarrassing program, but I'm still um, showing you. And what this program does, it runs an MPI job, which is, could basically do this message passing that I told you, but it runs the most simple MPI job that you could imagine. So I'm kind of abusing MPI to trigger a command 
on a remote uh, instance, on a remote compute instance. Um, the MPI job looks like this. Basically, I'm, I want to use 100 uh, virtual cores, and what I'm doing is I want to say MPI run, and all I do is host name on those 100 cores. So I, the idea is that those 100 cores, because I don't have 100 on one of those compute instances, some of them might report, should report back a different host name. So let me submit that, QSUB MPI, that's it. There's a little glitch, uh, don't worry about this uh, warning. Um, what I do is I say QSTAT, and you see that this job is running right now. And let me connect, these are the instances that I have. Let me refresh this to be sure. Ah, okay. Now, the effect that we see is that I only have the master node, and it needs to spin up the two compute nodes, uh, which will take a while. It actually takes a couple of minutes. Once those nodes are available, and we should see them coming up, hopefully soon. Ah, you see, this is it. They're pending, and it will take maybe a minute or two, or maybe up to three minutes until those really big nodes um, come up. Uh, let me tell you about those nodes. It was the this one, no, C5D18XL, which gives you 74 virtual CPUs um, and 144 gigabit of memory and like one, uh, like one, almost one terabyte, 900 megabyte, two times 900 megabyte of this NVMe-based SSD. Um, I'm not really sure if it's worth waiting for those nodes. Oh, they're running. No, 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 they're running, uh, they're running, but the status check is still uh, initializing. Let's go back to this and let's check the queue once more. It's still in the queue. Actually, what will happen is once they're really completely running and the status check has passed, um, this MPI will run on all the available virtual CPUs, um, which are twice the number of the ones that I have on one instance. And what it will produce, it it will produce an output. Now this one you see I was running today at 7.25 while you had your first coffee. I had my first coffee and I was running a massively parallel job. And the output is MPI SH09 is this. That's the host name now running on those 100 instances. And you see most of them are 235, but the, the first one are 234. So it's spreading them across those big machines. I only have two with a lot of cores. The other demo that I could do is like use a T3 micro and use like a thousand of them. That's the other way to do. Therefore, I have to raise my soft limit, which I couldn't do yesterday. This is why I went for the big machines with a lot of cores. So you see the principle? I'm happy to show you the result. It will be the same result as the one that I was running at um, 7.25. So I think you get the picture. Um, it's a Python, well, a Python framework tool that you can easily use to create your own supercomputer that honestly looks exactly like I was doing many years ago when we had this uh, brain um, application. Um, so I had the same job scheduler. I had the fixed size of machines. Um, I once got access to this real HPC computer, and I saw the same principle. I thought, like, even that time, I thought, like, this is like the interface they have, only submitting jobs, nothing interactive. But this is like HPC works. And with this, I want to change back to, to my slides. That was the um, open source GitHub project. Um, I want to conclude with, um, with a small video that is a little bit pathetic. I hope you can stand it. Um, but um, yes, I apologize um, if, if it's not your taste, but you can learn a lot from this video. If, if you are interested in rhetoric, you can learn about like excellent world-class rhetoric coming from uh, the President of the United States. Don't worry, it's JFK. Um, so <laughs> I, I encourage you to listen. There is something, it's called a rule of three. He will do something repeated three times, which makes it really, you know, really um, emphasizing. Then the important part comes, this is why I'm showing you this video. 
which is explaining why we do HPC. And then again, he does this rule of three, like three different other um, explanations. Watch it, remember three, then the important part, then three again. Of all mankind, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Okay, so the, the message is we have these problems that we choose to do not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And this is the typical HPC problem now. Creating these brain images that takes you like 12 days of computing power was not possible before. Um, and it was like a major breakthrough giving you know, this, this brain image to students and say, look, this is where in a human brain the opiate receptors are. Before people would like take a mouse, kill the mouse, cut the brain into slices and get the same result. But this image was created from living human people. Some of them are friends. I meet them you know, every week for drinking beer. Um, so it's major breakthroughs that you achieve with high performance computing. And the only way to achieve it is like throw a massive amount of compute at these problems and then still try to deal with it in an intelligent way. And I think the intelligent way today is um, using the cloud because it gives you all these benefits of elasticity and you pay for what you use. And first of all, you get access. No, it's also a bit of democratization because, I mean, if you're a student today and you work in a genomics project and you say, well, it will cost me, I will need a lot of CPU and memory, it will cost me like 300 bucks, yeah, just go and pay it, no, you will get the money, that's the easy part, getting the money. Getting accepted for a real HPC computer, I got rejected, no, and just say like, no, we don't, we don't want you, we don't trust that this will be reasonable. All right, so that's the conclusion. Um, it's the flexible configuration, it's virtually unlimited scalability, you can grow and shrink, um, your HPC infrastructure. You get this new HPC infrastructure, like, you know, every, every couple of months we come out with new um, instance types. So go and use them. Um, make good use of what we give you. These are all my contact details. Feel free to contact me. Um, that's the only uh, slide where you should take a picture of, maybe. I'll put it back. Um, if you want, we can go back to the... I still want to show you the result. No, nothing happens. Let me. Ah. I don't know. I have a black screen. <laughs> I wanted to show you. Let's see. Ah, remember I was showing you the nine and the O10. O is for output, E is for error. So there shouldn't be an, well, there is no E file. That means there was no error. It's showing 850, that's the last one. So MPI 010, that's the output. You see it's different host names. We had the 234 and 235, and now it's 42 and 26. So it was working, it was running. I'm super happy that this little demo worked. With this, I want to conclude. I'll be around if you have questions. I can take questions now if we have time. Yes, yes. Okay, we have time. Thank you. Any questions? So thanks to the speaker again. Thank you for being here.